Today, we'll be looking at how much do our genes restrict free will? If you're new to this channel, welcome. This is Mr. Singularity, where we explore the scientific and technological breakthroughs shaping the future as we know it. Many of us feel that we are masters of our own fate, but recent study shows the degree to which our action is conditioned by our genes. It is now possible to decode our human genetic code, a series of 3.2 billion DNA letters unique to each of us, which forms a blueprint for our brains and bodies. This series demonstrates how much of our behavior has a strong biological predisposition, which means that we might be biased towards the creation of a certain trait or feature. Research has shown that chromosomes can predispose not just our height, skin color, or weight, but also our susceptibility to mental disease, longevity, intellect, and impulsivity. These traits are, to varying degrees, encoded into our genomes, sometimes thousands of genes working together. Any of these genes teach us how our brain architecture is set in the fetus and how it operates. We can now see the brain of an infant as it is being developed, also 20 weeks before birth. Circuit differences occur in their brains and are closely associated with mutations that predispose to autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. They also predispose to disorders that could not have existed for decades, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia. More and more, we are faced with the possibility that predispositions to more nuanced habits are equally related to our brains. This includes the religion we chose, how we form our political views, and how we build our friendship groups. Nature and diet are interconnected. There are also other dimensions in which our life stories can be handed down through centuries besides being inscribed in our DNA. Epigenetics is a comparatively recent field of research that will show how interconnected nature and nurture can be. It does not look at gene modifications itself, but rather at the tags that are placed on genes by life experience that modify how our genes are expressed. One research in 2014 looked at epigenetic modifications in mice. Mice enjoyed the delicious scent of cherries because when the waft hits their nose, the brain's comfort region lights up inspiring them to scurry about and look for the treat. The researchers wanted to combine this smell with a slight electrical shock, and the mice soon learned to freeze in anticipation. The study showed that this new memory had been passed over centuries. The grandchildren of the mice became terrified of cherries, despite not having encountered electric shocks themselves. Grandpa's sperm DNA shifted its form, leaving a blueprint of the gene twinning experience. This is ongoing study and novel science, but concerns exist as to how these processes could be extended to humans. Preliminary findings suggest, however, that epigenetic modifications can affect the offspring of highly traumatic events. One research has found that the sons of U.S. Civil War captives had an 11% higher mortality rate in their mid-40s. Another small research found that Holocaust survivors and their children had epigenetic variations in a gene that was related to their cortisol levels, a hormone that is involved in the stress response. It's a confusing picture, but the data indicate that offspring have a higher net cortisol level and are thus more vulnerable to anxiety disorders. Do we have a free will scope? Of course, it's not enough that our lives are set in stone by the brain that we are born with the DNA that our parents have given us and the memories that our ancestors have handed down. Fortunately, there is already space for improvement. As we read, new links are emerging between nerve cells. When new skills are exercised or learning is resumed, the links are reinforced and learning is consolidated into memory. When the recollection is regularly accessed, it can become the normal path for neural signals in the brain, meaning the acquired behavior becomes a habit. Riding a bike, for example. We don't know how to ride one when we're born, but we can learn to do it by trial and error and a few minor crashes along the way. Related concepts form the basis for both vision and navigation. We make and reinforce synaptic connections as we walk through our surroundings and conjure up our understanding of the world that surrounds us. But there is a catch. Sometimes our previous learnings blind us to the truths of the future. We're all predisposed to seeing faces in our environment. This bias leads us to disregard the shadow signals that warn us that this is the back end of the mask. Instead, we rely on tried and tested mechanisms inside our brains 
creating a picture of another face. There's something magical about looking at us as an intricate machine. Data from the universe is stored in our unique minds to generate the output that is our behavior. However, many of us do not want to give up the illusion of becoming free agents. Biological determinism, the belief that human behavior is entirely hereditary, is right to make us anxious. It's abominable to consider that horrific things in our past have been done by people who have been helpless to stop them, and it gives rise to the specter that they could happen again. Perhaps instead, we can think of ourselves as not being limited by our genes. Recognizing the genetics that affect our individuality will then motivate us to properly pool our talents and use our mutual cognitive ability to shape the environment for the better. If you made it this far in the video, thank you and welcome to the end of the video club. What's your take on this? Comment below that I watched to the end and check out one of these other videos. This has been Mr. Singularity and I'll see you on the next one.